It is the 26th of September, 1919, and the Russian Civil War is raging. The Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine, an anarchist army consisting primarily of peasant fighters, has been cornered by a far larger anti-communist white army near the village of Peregonovka. Having been pursued for 400 miles, the desperate and ill-equipped anarchist army has resolved to make its last stand. At the head of this motley force stands Nesta Makhno, an anarchist revolutionary hailing from a poor family of Ukrainian peasants, and the man often credited with inventing the Tachanka, an armoured gun carriage used extensively on the vast plains of the eastern steppes during the Russian Civil War. Makhno and his movement, the Maknovshina as they were known, seized the opportunity in the chaos of the Russian Civil War to create a stateless and classless anarchist society based around agricultural communes, often shifting allegiances in the ever-changing political landscape of the old Russian Empire post-revolution in 1917. But how did the namesake of the movement, Nesta Makhno, come to lead these vast swathes of modern-day Ukraine and gain his reputation as an anarchist hero? For that, we have to go back to the year 1888. It was in 1888 that Nesta Makhno was born to a peasant family here, Uliaipol, in southern Ukraine, which at the time stood within the territory of the Russian Empire. With four older siblings, Makhno's parents, who were former serfs freed in 1861, struggled to feed the family off their small plot of land. Their poverty only deepened when Nesta was 10 months old, as his father died. At the age of eight, Makhno began to attend school, working on the local estate in his summers to bring in food for the family, along with his brothers. At the age of 10, the family's extreme poverty forced Makhno to give up on school and work in the fields full time. When he was 12, he witnessed a farm manager and landlord's sons beating a farmhand, which quickly escalated into a brawl, causing a spontaneous workers' revolt against the landlord. This, along with his mother's stories of her time in serfdom, instilled in Makhno a resentment for wealthy landowners. Makhno was 16 at the time of the tumultuous 1905 revolution. Initially, Nesta contributed to the revolutionary cause by distributing materials and literature, but before long, he joined Hulayapol's local anarcho-communist organization, the Union of Poor Peasants. Despite repression from the authorities, the group met regularly. Following the Stolypin agrarian reforms, which led to the creation of a wealthy landowning class known as Kulaks, Makhno's resistance to the Tsarist elite took on a violent dimension. He, along with other members of the Union of Poor Peasants, embarked on a series of raids against local businessmen, using the proceeds of their thefts to print materials opposing the reforms. Makhno was arrested, but released without charge in 1907, due to lack of evidence. However, when a member of the Union of Poor Peasants assassinated a police informant in 1909, Makhno was arrested once again. This time he was not so lucky. Sentenced to be hanged, the 21-year-old was granted a reprieve due to his age, and instead his punishment was commuted to life imprisonment. After suffering from a serious bout of typhoid, Makhno has moved to the infamous Buturka prison, well known for housing some 3,000 political prisoners. Throughout his incarceration, the young Ukrainian discussed a range of topics with his fellow inmates, learning a great deal of Russian history and political theory. In particular, he met the anarcho-communist intellectual Peter Arshinov, who would go on to document the Makhnovshina movement. It was in Buturka prison that Makhno began to write elaborating his own anarchist ideas in poetry and essays, which he would share amongst his fellow prisoners. Calling for a libertarian communist revolution, Makhno condemned nationalist ideas, adopting an internationalist stance when World War I broke out. When the February 1917 revolution swept through Moscow, Makhno was unexpectedly freed as the prison doors of Petirka were thrown open, allowing him to return home to Huliaipol in March 1917. The now 28-year-old Makhno was greeted as something of a local celebrity in his hometown, as a returning political exile. However, he found himself at odds with his former comrades in the Union of Poor Peasants, who wanted to focus on the production of propaganda. Instead, Makhno called for strong leadership 
in order to incite the local peasantry into action. To this end, he formed a local peasants' union and was swiftly elected chairman. Industrial unions also elected him to lead, and Makhno was soon a leading figure in the revolutionary movement around Huliaipol. Organising strike action, Makhno led workers in demanding increased wages, quickly leading to the establishment of worker control over all industries in the city. He also represented Huliaipol at the Regional Peasant Congress in Oleksandrivsk, which is modern-day Zaporizhia where he became known for demanding that large estates be reclaimed by their local communities and redistributed among the peasants. Frustrated by the constant machinations and lack of action at the Congress, Makhno began the process of redistribution in Hulayapol by disarming local law enforcement and seizing property from landowners, in defiance of the Russian provisional government. Although Makhno's local action was increasingly successful and his regional popularity grew amongst the peasants, he was despairing of the wider anarchist movement, which, rather fittingly, was highly disorganised and struggling to compete for influence with the other established political parties. Following the Russian general Kornilov's attempted coup against the provisional government, Makhno redoubled his revolutionary efforts, this time forming a committee for the defence of the revolution in Huliaipol. His peasant brigades expropriated property, seized large estates and organised agrarian communes. Peasants withheld their rents and occupied the landlord's property. Makhno himself personally worked on one such commune with his wife Nastia. He reportedly laboured on the land two days a week and occasionally helped to repair farm machinery. With the authority of the provisional government terminally damaged by the Kornilov affair, the October Revolution of 1917 saw Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik party seize control of the Russian government through armed insurrection in the city of Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg. This event plunged Russia into civil war and had dire consequences for Ukraine too. Increased hostilities between Ukrainian nationalists and Bolsheviks led to the outbreak of the Ukrainian-Soviet War. Owing to his internationalist stance, Makhno supported the Bolsheviks against the Ukrainian nationalists and their anti-communist allies, the White Movement. Dispatching his brother, Savelli, with an armed detachment of anarchists, Makhno's forces aided the Bolsheviks in retaking Oleksandrivsk from the nationalists. On the 9th of February 1918, the new Ukrainian People's Republic signed an agreement with the Central Powers, inviting Germany and Austro-Hungarian troops to occupy the country. Naturally, as a committed anarcho-communist, Makhno opposed the invasion and formed a volunteer unit to resist the invading forces. While the anarchist leader was travelling to Oleksandrivsk, to link up with Bolshevik forces, the Ukrainian nationalists seized Huliaipol and handed control of the town over to Austro-Hungarian forces. Effectively exiled from his hometown, Makhno travelled through Russian territory, regrouping with fellow anarchists from Huliaipol and gathering support for the Ukrainian anarchist cause. Several encounters during this time altered Makhno's perception of the greater revolutionary cause. It was during this period that he witnessed the Cheka the first Soviet secret police force, executing revolutionary insurgents who had disobeyed their orders, leading Makhno to question whether the revolution may be prevented by institutional revolutionaries. Making his way to Moscow, Makhno was further disillusioned by the preoccupation of Muscovite anarchists with propaganda and slogans. He also met his old cellmate here, Peter Arshinov. Intriguingly, Makhno also met Lenin while in Moscow, the Bolshevik leader reportedly quizzed Makhno at length on the state of Ukraine, lamenting that the revolution there had been led by anarchists. Makhno passionately defended the anarchist movement, particularly denying the often stated Bolshevik charge that the Ukrainian anarchists were counter-revolutionary. Lenin was reportedly impressed by the young Ukrainian, expressing his admiration and granting Makhno's request for papers to allow him to travel home. He returned to Huliaipol in late June, content that he had taken the temperature of the revolution. In his absence, Ukraine had been subject to yet more political upheaval. The occupying Austro-Hungarian forces had staged a coup, turning the young Ukrainian nation into a client state. Makhno found that many of his revolutionary colleagues had been killed by the occupying forces. His brother Emelian had even been executed, and his brother Savelli arrested. Once back in town, Makhno wasted no time in preparing once again to foment revolution. 
laying plans for a general uprising, organising guerrilla raids against landowners, and advocating terrorist attacks against the authorities. As Makno's activity intensified, the authorities placed a bounty on his head, forcing him to retreat to nearby Tanivka, from where he engaged in raids against Austrian positions, gathering weaponry and supplies. As the scope of Makno's activities grew, so too did the attempts by the occupying forces to capture him. Withdrawing to the Dubrivka forest, Makno led a surprise counterattack to break Austrian encirclement, winning a famous victory for which his troops dubbed him Batko, meaning father. With ever-increasing numbers of peasant insurgents flocking to his banner, Makno was finally able to capture Huliaipol in November 1918. That same month, in November 1918, the end of World War I changed the political landscape once again. The defeat of the Central Powers saw the collapse of the Ukrainian client state and the re-establishment of a nationalist Ukrainian government under Simon Petelura. Simultaneously, the Bolsheviks once again invaded Ukraine from the north, while the presence of the White Army in the south threatened Makhno's movement. Caught in the middle, Nesta decided upon an alliance with the Bolshevik Red Army. Initially, Makhno led anarchist forces alongside Red Army units, until in January 1919, his forces were integrated into the Ukrainian Soviet Army as part of the 3rd trans Dnieper Brigade, with Makhno serving as a commander. For Makhno, this alliance was always an uneasy one. His contempt for certain aspects of Bolshevik administration, such as the secret police and political commissars, was evident. However, he reconciled his decision with his assertion that ideological differences must be subordinate to the ultimate goal of revolution. Despite glowing reports of Makhno's frontline leadership in the Bolshevik newspaper Pravda, the Bolshevik generals were uneasy with Makhno's anarchist ideas and declared his regional congresses to be counter-revolutionary. When another Ukrainian partisan leader, Nikifor Krihorev, revolted against Bolshevik rule, Makhno declared his loyalty to the Bolsheviks and the revolution. However, he added the caveat that he would virulently oppose the Cheka, the secret police, and any other organs of oppression and violence, going on to condemn the authoritarianism and political repression of the Bolsheviks, and even comparing it to Tsarist Russia. Unsurprisingly, this move startled the Red Army leadership, who swiftly declared Makhno an outlaw. Leon Trotsky, who himself would famously fall foul of Soviet political repression some decades later, even published a diatribe attacking the Ukrainian anarchist. Despite Makhno's attempts to allay Trotsky's criticisms by resigning his Red Army post, a warrant for his arrest was issued. Makhno fled the front with his partisans, vowing to wage a guerrilla war against the White Movement and settle his score with the Bolsheviks at a later date. Retreating to Kurzon, Makhno and his Makhnovist forces hoped to secure an alliance with the rebel Nikifor Khrihorov. However, at a public meeting between the two movements, relations turned sour. As Khrihorov's anti-Semitic policies, use of pogroms and connections to the white movement came to light, the meeting became extremely tense. Khrihorov reportedly reached for his pistol, and as he did so, was gunned down by the Makhnovists. What remained of Khrihorov's forces were integrated into Makhno's army, which at this time probably numbered around 20,000 men. It is also worth noting that large numbers of Red Army deserters were flocking to Makhno's banner at the time. The Red Army, retreating in the face of Anton Denikin's White Army, was suffering from widespread mutinies and desertions. By September 1919, the Bolshevik Red Army had largely fled northwards from Ukraine, leaving Makhno's insurgents to fight the powerful White Army alone. The anarchists used raiding tactics to row far and wide across the front, attacking White Army forces unexpectedly from behind enemy lines. However, the inevitable White offensive slowly gained ground, pushing the anarchists all the way to Uman. Cornered and unwilling to retreat further, Makhno rallied his troops to make a last stand. On the morning of the 26th of September, after a night of heavy fighting, the anarchists had been forced back to the outskirts of Paragonovka by superior White Army forces. In a last-ditch assault, Nestor Makhno led his company in a flanking manoeuvre, crashing into the rear of the White Army. Miraculously, the ferocity of their desperate attack panicked the White Army, sending them into a full-scale retreat. Astounded at their success, the anarchists set off in hot pursuit. In the aftermath of the Battle of Perigonovka, 
Makhno split his forces in order to gain as much territory as possible. The Makhnovists were able to capture vast swathes of southern and eastern Ukraine, depriving the White Army of its supply lines and preventing them from advancing upon Moscow. In captured Katerinoslav, modern-day Dnipro, Bolshevik sympathizers attempted to set up a committee to control the city, suggesting that Makhno simply control the military forces. However, Makhno was by this point utterly opposed to the Bolsheviks. He called them parasites upon the workers' lives. Instead, he attempted to establish the anarcho-communist agrarian society that had become central to his ideology. At a congress in Alexandrivsk, he presented the draft declaration of the Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine, which proposed the foundation of local Soviets, untainted by political parties, to oversee their transition to a stateless agrarian society. However, implementation of these grand plans proved to be difficult, as it was not long before White Army forces returned to besiege the city of Katerinoslav, modern-day Dnipro, which Makhno was forced to abandon in early 1920. Furthermore, an epidemic of typhus tore through the Makhnovist forces, severely weakening Makhno's campaigning ability. Nestor himself caught the disease so badly that for some time he was comatose. To make matters worse, the Red Army returned to Ukraine in 1920, encouraged by the relative weakness of the white movement in the region. It is worth taking a moment to discuss the tactics used by the Makhnovists. Although at their height in late 1919, the Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine supposedly boasted somewhere around 80,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry. For much of its existence, Makhno's forces were underpowered and much fewer in number, particularly when compared with the considerable red and white forces which they engaged with. Making use of fast-moving guerrilla tactics, Makhno was able to effectively counter far larger enemy armies, frequently utilising ambush and disguise in order to outwit the enemy. Makhno's army was also known for their use of the Tachanka, a horse-drawn carriage mounted with a machine gun. This revolutionary weapon allowed Makhno's forces to move quickly around the battlefield while unleashing a hail of bullets upon their enemies. Makhno himself has been credited with the invention of the weapon, although it was supposedly also used by Russian forces on the Eastern Front during World War I. The strength of the Tachanka lay in its maneuverability, Early machine guns, such as the Maxim, were extremely deadly. However, they were also heavy and cumbersome, a problem that was solved by mounting them onto a carriage. Tachanka had the added benefit of being very cheap and easy to produce, making it an accessible weapon for Makhno's poorly equipped army. The Tachanka was a game changer on the battlefield. It allowed Makhno's forces to move quickly and attack enemy positions with deadly force. The psychological impact of the Tachanka was also significant. The sight of a horse-drawn carriage charging towards them with a machine gun was a terrifying prospect for Makhno's enemies. However, the Tachanka was not without its vulnerabilities. It was extremely exposed to artillery fire, which could easily destroy or damage the horse-drawn carriage and the machine gun mounted on it. Additionally, the Tachanka was very difficult to control on rough terrain, which could affect its accuracy and effectiveness in combat. Declared an outlaw by the Bolsheviks, Makhno embarked upon a period of guerrilla resistance. Captured Red Army officers would be executed on the spot, while soldiers would be offered the chance to defect or be sent home. So effective was Makhno's guerrilla campaign that by June 1920, the Bolsheviks approached the anarchist leader with proposals for an alliance against the White Army. While remaining distrustful of the Bolsheviks and denying their political authority, Makhno recognised the usefulness of a military alliance, and hoped victory over the Whites might oblige the Bolsheviks to acquiesce to his political demands, a decision he later described as a grave error. On the 22nd of October 1920, Uliaipol was once again captured by Makhno's forces. The anarchist leader himself, having sustained injuries, stayed in the town, while his army continued south with the Bolshevik forces, eventually defeating the White Army in Crimea in November 1920. True to form, the Bolshevik Red Army had secretly developed plans to betray the Makhnovists and capture Huliaipol. In November 1920, after defeating the White Army in Crimea, they put this plan into action, taking the city in a surprise attack, which Makhno was only just able to escape, along with 150 of his guards. Gathering local forces, he retook Huliaipol within the week, 
Vladimir Lenin's order that Makhno should be liquidated led to the rapid convergence of Red Army units on Uliaipol. Makhno, realizing how dire his situation was, regrouped with his force that had been dispatched to Crimea. This detachment had been reduced by four-fifths and its commander had been assassinated by the Bolsheviks. Hoping to break the Red Army encirclement, Makhno attacked vigorously, routing a brigade at Komar and recapturing Berdyansk and Andrivka. When this failed to break the encirclement, Makhno adopted different tactics, breaking his forces up into small parties and pushing deep into Red Army territory towards Kurzon and Kyiv. Heading to Galicia before doubling back south across the Dnieper, the anarchists managed to evade the pursuing Red Army by January 1921 after a 1500 km chase across Ukraine. Deciding on a bold strategy, Makhno divided his forces into separate detachments and sent them across southern and central Russia in an attempt to stir up insurrection against the Bolsheviks, and in particular against the hated secret police, the Cheka. Remaining along the banks of the Dnieper, Makhno's contingent roved up and down the river, routing Red Army units and plundering their equipment. After sustaining a foot injury, Makhno entered battle in the Tachanka. Another engagement saw him sustain a serious wound to the stomach, for which he had to be evacuated. As spring turned into summer in 1921, the Bolsheviks began to devote ever more resources to the quashing of Makhno's insurgency. A Makhnovist assault on Kharkiv had to be called off due to the strength of the city's defences, and the Red Army had assembled a motorised unit to specifically hunt down the anarchist leader. In July, the Red Army leadership demanded a definitive liquidation of the Makhnovists. By this time, owing to Red Army activity, Makhno's forces had been restricted to the Don River Basin, and Makhno himself had sustained several serious wounds in battle. By August, Makhno's wounds were so serious that they forced him to seek treatment abroad. With a personal guard, Makhno made a push for the border. Ambushed and pursued all the way by Red Army forces, he was shot in the neck, but in late August managed to reach Romania. The badly injured Makhno, along with his wife and a small party of followers, found themselves imprisoned by Romanian border guards at Brasov, before being moved to Bucharest, where they were allowed to live under police surveillance. His presence in the country caused Bolshevik politicians to call for his immediate extradition. However, the Romanian government refused, citing the lack of an extradition treaty between the two states, and the fact that the Romanians had recently abolished capital punishment. As the disagreements rumbled on, Makhno sensed danger and decided to make a break for the Polish border. Once again, the anarchist and his wife were captured at the border and interned in a Polish prison camp in April 1923. Eventually freed in November 1923, Makhno and his family remained in Poland until April 1925, when, with the help of fellow anarchists, he travelled to Paris via Berlin. The great anarchist leader lived out the rest of his days in Paris. Although there were many fellow Ukrainian exiles in the city, and a large community of anarchists from all over Europe, Makhno found himself chronically homesick in such a large city, which was only exacerbated by the strong language barrier. This, combined with his ill health from recurring tuberculosis and old battle wounds, led to Makhno falling into bouts of acute depression. He spent the remainder of his days working various jobs that his ill health would allow, whilst also writing articles and publishing memoirs. Nestor Makhno died on the 25th of July, 1934, finally succumbing to the tuberculosis that dogged him in his final years. Although Makhno's dreams of a stateless anarchist society were realised only very briefly, his deeds have captured the imagination of many following the defeat of the Makhnovists in the Russian Civil War. He is a local hero in his hometown of Uliaipol, with a statue in the town square and his story has been looked up to as an inspiration by anarchists ever since.